Hello again, boys and girls. It's Mr. Wassman, and today we are once again in our math journal on pages 86 and 87, ordering fractions. This is Unit 3, Lesson 7, and it's a two-page spread because one page relates to the next. So let's start on page 86, shall we? It says, write the following fractions in order from smallest to largest. Okay? Now, number one is pretty straightforward. We have five fractions that all have the same denominator. That means they have like denominators. So that means we are just counting pieces on the top, or in other words, the numerator. Okay? So if I'm going to order them from smallest to largest, I need to find the smallest number, which you and I both know is 1. So then I would write the fraction 1 tenth first, followed by 2 tenths. And since 3 tenths is not represented here, I would go to the next largest fraction, that's 4 tenths. Then 5, 6, 7 tenths, 8 tenths, and then I'm out of fractions. So I have now ordered them from smallest to largest. Now, let's scroll on over to page 87. And it says, for each of the problems on journal page 86, justify your conclusions. Justify your conclusions. That's just a fancy way of saying show your uh, work by representing the approximate position of each fraction on the number line. Approximate. Okay. So this number line begins at 0 and ends in one whole. So if I'm thinking dollars, because money is a great way to uh, frame uh, fractions, okay? One-tenth of a dollar is a dime. So I know that, hey, I have 10 dimes for every dollar. So this number line would uh, logically want to be split up into 10 parts. And they've already given you the first two hash marks right here for 1 tenth and 2 tenths. So the easiest thing for you to do is to create some more hash marks, like so. And of course, we're going to do this by hand. I'm using this computer stylus myself, so they're not going to be exactly uh, equidistant apart from each other, but you get the gist. Okay, so now I have to plug in the other fractions. Well, one-tenth and two-tenth has already been done for me, so now I just have to uh, plot four, seven, and eight. Four, seven, and eight. So again, I go to my number line. I'm going to skip three-tenths. I'm going to write four-tenths here. Five-tenths, six-tenths, seven-tenths would go here and then 8 tenths right after it. So when I survey my number line, all five fractions from the previous number one problem are there. Okay, so let's look at some of the other problems. Okay, problem number two, on the other hand, does not have like denominators. They have unlike denominators. Okay, if you take a look, I have one fourth, one half, one twelfth, one fifth, and one one hundredth. Okay, um, they have unlike denominators. However, if you notice at the top, they all have like numerators, meaning that we are comparing one part out of each total number of parts. Okay, so if you can imagine one fourth and one half, if I were to draw a rectangle, like so, and I were to divide it into one-fourth, I would cut it in half, and then cut it in half again. That would represent four parts, and if I shade it in one of those parts, that would be my one-fourth. Now, the same thing can happen with one-half. Okay. I divide this rectangle in half, and then I shade in one of the parts. It gives me one half. Now I can see that one half is larger than one fourth. Okay, even though four as a digit 
represents a larger amount, that does not make the fraction bigger when it's in our denominator. What it actually does, it says, since there are more parts to be had, one individual part, one-fourth, is going to be less than one-half. So in this example, we're going to write the fractions uh, from the largest denominator to the smallest. So we're going to go in reverse numeric order by denominator. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to look for the largest denominator in this row. And when I survey the five numbers, the five fractional parts, you can see that obviously 100 is the largest. One penny is a lot smaller than one quarter of a dollar. So I would write 1 one hundredth right here. That is my largest denominator. Then I look at the other four denominators, and I see that 12 is the second largest denominator, followed by 5, 1 fifth, 1 fourth, and then 1 half. OK? So again, I'm going to plot those numbers on a number line. Number 2 on page 86 will correspond with number 2 on page 87. Now, unlike the first number line where all the uh, denominators were the same, meaning that they were all spaced apart by the same size apart, a tenth, all of our denominators represent a different fractional amount of that line. Okay. So we're actually going to start in reverse order because one half is easy to visualize and it's already marked off on our line here. It's this little hash mark right here. That's our one half mark. That's one half for all of our lines. Okay, but above here I'm going to write one half. And since one half is the largest amount, that means that nothing is going to be written beyond the one half mark. Okay, so again, let's start with what we know. One half is the largest. The second largest is one fourth. Okay, and one fourth, if you look at my model, is literally half the size of one half. Okay, if I were to divide my rectangle over here that shows halves in half again, you'll notice that two fourths is the equivalent of one half. Okay, so one fourth is literally one half of a half. Okay, so when I mark that out on my my number line, okay, I have one half right here. I have zero right here. One fourth is going to be halfway between. Okay, you've probably recognized that when you've measured with inches on a ruler. Okay, so this hash mark right here represents one-fourth. So that now means that every other fraction is going to be to the left side of one-fourth. Okay, we have one-fifth, one-twelfth, and one-one-hundredth. Well, one-fifth is slightly smaller than one-fourth, so we can put it right about there. This isn't going to be 100% accurate, but you're going to get the idea. One-tenth of a whole as you can see in the number line, is over here. So 1 12th, which is a larger denominator, means that there's going to be a smaller piece. That means it's going to be closer to 1, or to the 0, okay? So if I gauge placement based on the number line above me, 1 10th is going to be further along than 1 12th. So 1 12th should be maybe right about here. Okay, not quite towards where one tenth is, but close. So I'm going to write one twelfth as a fraction, right above that line, and then finally one one hundredth is such a small fraction. It's going to be practically on top of where zero is. So one one hundredth would go over here. Okay, and that's how we plot out these number lines with the fractions that we've ordered. Okay, one last little. Thing to draw your attention to. You're going to notice that one half at the second number line corresponds with one half on the first number line. And in the first number line, we were counting off by tenths. 
What comes after four tenths? Well, that would be five tenths. Five tenths is the same distance from zero as one half, which means that these two fractions are, you guessed it, equivalent. That's right. The same is true for two tenths and one fifth. They are the same place on the number line, which makes them equivalent. There you go, a little bonus knowledge for you. Okay? So go ahead and try working on the rest of these number lines by first ordering the fractions over here. And again, you can consult your SRB. Page 142 in particular is a handy reference because it has a table of equivalent fractions. So if you get stuck on, say, especially on number 4 and 5 where you have unlike numerators and unlike denominators, I would use that as a reference. Okay? If you have questions, talk to your math teacher. That's why they are there. That's why they get paid the big bucks. Otherwise, we will talk again soon. Thanks, friends.